I have the Nikon D5200 in my hands and you're seeing its menu system. Now, whether you're shooting with any Nikon D5000 series, D3000 series, anything in the entry level range is going to have a pretty similar menu system. So what I want to do is I want to go through the menu system and make the changes that I typically make on cameras when I just receive them. So on this D5200, I went ahead and reset most of the settings, but we'll go through each one and make sure that we address all the items that we need to address uh, to make this camera perfectly usable for our needs. So here, first, let's go over the tab. So we've got the playback menu, we've got the shooting menu, custom setting menu, setup menu, retouch menu, and my menu. So let's go over these one at a time. We'll start with the playback menu. If you're not sure what a menu item does, you can actually press the question mark button on the rear of the camera, which is also the zoom out button on this Nikon D5200. Now here under delete, if I press that, you will say delete all or selected images. Now you can see on the bottom left corner, there's a question mark under each menu item whenever that help is available you can see it will pop up so it's not showing up here because there is actually sub menus within this menu but now you can see that if I move it will be able to I will be able to look it up so if I press that I can read all the help that I need so that's just something to keep in mind if you're not sure and you do not want to go back to your manual that's how you can look up the information. Now let's go through the stuff. There's not a whole lot of stuff that I actually change in the playback menu, but the fir very first item for me all, all the time is actually the playback display options. And here what I do is I select the information that I want to see. Now right now it's all empty, haven't selected anything, but I always pick highlights and overview. Now I don't do all this other stuff like RGB histogram and shooting data. And the reason why is because I'll show you what that does. I'll go ahead and click OK now. And if I actually play back an image, if I press the up or down buttons, it will toggle between all this information. Now there's a lot of stuff here and I keep pressing the button and I just don't care for all that information. I just want to see the summary. I want to see blinkies or the potential information that I'm losing in an image. And I also want to see this basic exposure information. For that reason, I'm going to go back into the menu and I am going to go ahead and uncheck the histogram, which is basically the, the one that you saw with three colors, the red, green, and blue, and the shooting data, which is just a bunch of information that I don't necessarily need. So just overview and highlights is okay. Now, if I go back and play, just press up, down, and I see three bits of information. So this full screen is just the image. Then the next, I've got the highlight. So if anything was being overexposed in this image, it would start basically blinking at me. And then next, I've got the basic exposure information. So that's all I really need. I'm gonna go ahead and go back. Next, we have image review. Now this one is basically, whenever you take a picture, the camera will display the image that you captured on the rear LCD the moment after you capture it. And by default, it's turned on. Well, I usually turn it off. And the reason why I turn it off is because I do not want to chimp as I work with subjects. I want to concentrate on my photography. And at the same time, I do not want to waste my battery. But if you're annoyed by the, by the fact that the camera will not display anything after each image, you can come back here and turn this option on. Next, we've got Rotate Tall, and this one I personally always turn off. By default, it's turned on. The reason why I turn this off is because if I'm going to go ahead and keep that turn on, display an image that is vertical, like in this shot, what happens is that you get all this black space to the left and to the right of the image. And for me, it's a lot of space that's being wasted. I'm seeing less of an image. For me, it's easier to just turn the camera and look at it sideways than look at, look at it this way. So what I do is I'm gonna go ahead and go back to menu and turn off that rotate tall. And now you see that the image that was vertical is now displayed horizontally. And if, if this was a vertical image, all I have to do is turn the camera sideways. All right, so next we've got other options like slideshow, DPOF print order, none of that stuff really matters, so I just skipped that. All right, let's go back now to the main menu and scroll down to the shooting menu tab. Here we've got a bunch of options. The first option is reset shooting menu, which basically if I 
press the uh, right arrow, it will allow me to reset everything to the factory default. So next we've got the storage folder. I wouldn't worry about that, but if you want to rename the folder where images are being stored, you can do that from here. Next we've got image quality, and this one is actually very important. This is probably the first setting that I change on every camera when I receive it. Because what I do is I switch to RAW. Now, if you've been shooting JPEG and you're not comfortable with shooting RAW, I would recommend shooting RAW plus JPEG. At least that gives you the ability to go back and look at RAW images in the future if you're not com comfortable with doing that today. But if you're shooting JPEG and you're wondering what are these uh, fine, normal, and basic settings are or on the bottom or on the top, you should keep in mind that fine is basically full resolution, normal is medium resolution, and basic is the smallest resolution. There is no reason why you would want to shoot normal or basic, so always shoot fine. If you're choosing between different options, just choose RAW plus JPEG fine. That's, that gives you the, the best quality and the highest resolution for both RAW and JPEG images. But I usually just shoot RAW, so I'm going to go ahead and select that. Next, we've got the image size, and it's, as you can see, it's grayed out. The reason why it's grayed out is because if I do change it to JPEG, I can see it because this actually only applies to JPEG images. So here you can see large is 24 megapixels, and that's the resolution of this camera. Medium is 13.5 megapixels, and small is 6 megapixels. Again, there's no reason why you would want to do that. If you actually enable RAW plus JPEG fine, that option will still, you will be able to go in and change. Uh, but in RAW, it becomes grayed out. All right, next we've got white balance. White balance auto is just perfectly fine because I shoot RAW. If you do shoot JPEG and you're worried about having the correct white balance, then you have all these different templates and you can even use uh, the presets, which is basically you can uh, do custom, uh, like you can measure white balance or use a photo as a reference for, for white balance. Anyway, uh, I just keep it at auto, and here you can even customize that. All right, next we've got set picture control. Now, this doesn't matter at all if you shoot RAW. It only affects JPEG images, and it only affects the image preview on the rear LCD if you do shoot RAW. So keep in mind, this will not change anything in the actual RAW file. It will only change the preview that is being generated from that RAW file on the rear LCD. So if I do end up choosing, say, Vivid, which will boost all of my colors, the, you will see the change on the rear LCD, but it doesn't mean that that change is being applied to the RAW file. Now, something to keep in mind, you can actually uh, adjust this further by pressing the right arrow. And if I go here, you can see there is a bunch of different, there are a bunch of settings like sharpening, contrast, brightness, saturation, and hue. And you can either make quick adjustments, which basically boost values like sharpening and contrast and saturation, or you can go to individual ones and make adjustments. Now, I don't really mess with this at all. I just leave it at factory defaults. I don't under sharpen or over sharpen because then I won't be able to tell whether the image is truly sharp or not. That's why I just keep it at everything at the factory defaults. Again, nothing that will impact my raw images anyway. Next, we've got Manage Picture Control, and under here, we've got the ability to save and load your picture controls. Again, doesn't really matter because I shoot RAW. Auto Distortion Control, Color Space, Active Delighting, all these settings, usually, I don't touch except maybe for the color space. And that one, if you shoot JPEG, you should keep it at sRGB because that's what the internet uses and everybody has devices that can view sRGB color space. But if you choose Adobe RGB, which is I personally that what I do when I shoot RAW, it allows me to actually see the more accurate representation of the histograms. Now, this information like distortion control, active delighting, and then all these other things like HDR and high ISO uh, noise reduction, these things I always turn off. And the reason why I keep them turned off is because, again, has no effect on raw images. So I'm going to go ahead and turn all of that stuff off. Now, there is exception, though. There is an exception for this long exposure noise reduction. And the reason why is because 
when you shoot a really long exposure and we're talking 30 seconds or more your sensor is going to heat up and that generates a lot of noise and there is an ability for your camera to take two exposures one actual image and one reference photo and then what the camera does it looks at all the noise that's being generated in that second image and then subtracts it from the first one so if you do shoot 30 or sec 30 second or longer exposures then you might want to keep this long exposure noise reduction on and it certainly does affect raw images now something to keep in mind since there are two images being taken if your exposure is say 30 seconds then your total exposure time will be one minute because it has to take that first shot then it has to take the second reference shot so just keep that in mind I usually just keep it turned off unless I really do want to shoot really really long exposures and as you can see here HDR is turned off and again we're not shooting JPEG and that's the only way you can bring this back is if you choose JPEG either raw plus JPEG or just JPEG next we've got ISO sensitivity settings and this one is actually really important because this is where you set your ISO sensitivity from on all Nikon DSLRs it's always going to be under the shooting menu so this one uh, you want to actually keep your ISO sensitivity at ISO 100 that's basically the base ISO which gives you the highest amount uh, highest dynamic range best colors best image quality so always try to keep your ISO at ISO 100 but if you absolutely need to need to increase the ISO to maybe uh, ISO 200 400 if your light conditions change then you can do that from here now there's another setting here that's called auto ISO sensitivity control I'm not going to go into details but basically your ha your camera has the ability to automatically change ISO if your shutter speed drops below a certain threshold now here if I enable that option you can see I have maximum sensitivity and minimum shutter speed so basically you can control how high that ISO can fluctuate when those shutter speeds drop to certain levels in the, on this camera I'm pretty comfortable with 1600 maybe push it as high as 3200 but I'm not going to push it to 6400 because it's going to result in a lot of grain so I usually just set maximum sensitivity at either 1600 or 3200 on DX cameras as far as minimum shutter speed on these newer cameras you have this great option which is called auto now if you look up what a reciprocal rule is basically you the best way to handhold a camera is to try to match the shutter speed to the focal length of the lens now on this camera right now I have a 35 millimeter lens uh, connected to it so my shutter speed needs to be at least 1 35th of a second for me not to have blur but also keep in mind there's also the 1.5 X crop factor and you need to throw that into equation so the technical limitation for proper hand holding according to the reciprocal rule is actually 35 multiplied by 1.5 X which is roughly 50 so roughly I need to be at about 1 50th of a second and this camera is actually pretty smart in that regard it's going to try to match that by if I go to auto it will try to keep my shutter speed at a particular shutter speed so that I don't get blur but if I wanted to go lower as you can see I can go two grades lower or faster I can do that from here so at this point if I keep it at, at uh, the medium range here under slower or in, in the right in the center then what will happen is it will try to match the focal length of the lens if I use a zoom lens like a 52 200 and I'm at 200 millimeters it will try to keep that shutter speed at minimum of 1 200th of a second so that's just something to keep in mind if you if you have shaky hands you have the option to go one level higher by doing that you're going to basically double that minimum shutter speed so say if you're at 1 50th of a second here it would go to 1 100th of a second and going one level higher would double that further to 1 200th of a second so that's just something to, to keep in mind and you, you obviously have the option to choose any shutter speed you want from this list that goes down all the way to one full second all right so that's basically it with auto ISO sensitivity control I usually always keep that on because I do not want to mess with changing ISOs and I want the camera to manage that for me next we've got release mode next there's release mode and you have the ability to choose from single frame to continuous to self timer and maybe using different remotes now when you 
press the shutter release and hold it, by default, the camera will only fire one shot. But if you're shooting action and say you wanted to switch to continuous shooting, you could actually pick either continuous low or continuous high. And when you press that shutter release, the camera will fire for a long time until the buffer on the camera fills up. So if you wanted to do that, you would have to do it through the menu setting here. Now on higher end cameras, this will be available on a dial. On lower end cameras, it's a menu setting. And the last option here is quiet shutter release, which basically slows down the mirror so that the camera sounds a little bit more quiet. All right, so by default, I just go single frame. But again, if you shoot action, you would switch it from here. Next, we've got multiple exposure. Now, this is a creative mode where you can actually take multiple exposures and the camera will combine them into a single image. You can choose number of shots, so you can go up to three and minimum is two. And then there's also an option for auto gain. And auto gain basically tries to match brightness between your shots. All right. Next, we've got interval timer shooting, and this is for people that like to shoot time lapses. Here, you've got different options. You can start it now, you can set time, and, and things like that, and there's lots of different options for you to customize that behavior. I'm not gonna mess with that. Next, we've got, oops, we've got movie settings. And under movie settings, you've got the option to choose the frame rate and the resolution of the video. You can go up to 60i on this one. Movie quality, microphone, manual movie settings. I'm not gonna worry about those because this is not about shooting movies. Next is custom settings menu. Now this one is pretty extensive and it can get pretty complex for a beginner to understand, but we will go through these one at a time so that you can understand what each function does. Now, the important thing about the custom setting menu is that well, obviously here you've got the reset custom settings. So if you mess up something and your camera doesn't behave the way it used to, or you want to go back to the factory defaults, this is where you reset it from. But basically you've got these sub menus and then underneath you have even more menus. Now, the important thing is you've got letters here and the colors to designate each one of these. So if you go to say exposure, you, the camera will take you directly to that exposure setting within that big list. So you can navigate this list just going scrolling down or you can go back and choose the main sub menu and then from there you are right there. So anyway, we're gonna go to autofocus, start there. A1, A2, A3, A4, they basically all cover autofocus. Then from there we go to exposure. But basically, whenever you make a change here, what will happen is, say I change from focus to release, you can see there is a star right above A. And what that means is that you've changed the factory default. So that's how you can tell what changes you have made in the camera system. If you want to go back and reset that, again, you can do that in the main menu or simply change to whatever other option is available and that will should go back to the defaults unless there's too many settings underneath. Anyway, so uh, we'll start with A1, AFC priority selection. Now this is for continuous shooting. If you're shooting action, sports, wildlife, where you're taking lots of shots, basically you have two options. One is to release, which basically the camera is not going to worry about uh, getting focused first and then allowing you to fire, is just going to let you fire even if the subject is not in focus. And the second option is to focus. Basically it will prioritize focus first. Now, if you select focus and your subject is not in focus, the camera will not fire. So that's something really important for you to keep in mind. If you're taking photographs of, a, you know, say, your dog running towards you or your child in the field running and the camera is not firing, this is how you would find out. If the camera is set to focus, that means without the subject being in perfect focus according to the camera, the shutter will not release. So I keep this at release because I still want to fire the shot and still at least get something when I'm shooting in continuous mode. Under A2, we've got number of focus points. Now this camera has 39 focus points, but for whatever reason, if you wanted to change to 11 focus points, this is where you do it from. I see no reason to do that, so I just keep it at default 39 focus points. 
Built-in AF assist illuminator is basically that lamp in front of the camera. Whenever you're shooting in single mode, in AFS mode, the camera, if you're shooting, say, in a very low light environment, if the camera cannot focus, it will actually use that beam to try to get focus on your subject. So if you're annoyed by that lamp, you can turn it off here. I personally keep it on. Next, there's range finder. And by default, this is turned off. But basically, if you want to see when you switch to a manual focus lens or maybe switch to manual focusing on your lens, then what you can do is you can have within the viewfinder arrows that point if the subject is front focused or back focused. It's kind of neat to have that because it will even show you the degree of how much the subject is out of focus, front focused or back focused. So I just keep this turned on. Next, we've got B1, which is EV steps for exposure control. Now, if I go back, you can see that we're under the exposure sub panel. On more high air and cameras, you're going to have a lot more options here. But basically, I would just leave this behavior at the default, which is one third of a step. Unless you really know what you're doing, I would not mess with this setting. All right, we've got C1 shutter release button AEL. And now, obviously, we're under timers and E lock. And what this does, Next, we're under C1 shutter release button AEL, and this basically throws us at timers slash AE lock section. And basically what this feature does is it allows you to lock the exposure when you half press the shutter release. Now, if I turn it on and say if I'm doing a focus and recompose technique and I already had my exposure locked and I really like it and now I want to include the sun in the frame. Well, if I don't have this turned on and I continue to half press the shutter release, the exposure will change. But if I want to lock it every time when I half press the shutter release, by turning it on, the camera will lock it. So by default, it's turned off. I like keeping this turned on. And keep in mind that this only works when you're shooting in any of the program modes. So if you're shooting in manual mode, it really doesn't matter. Next, we've got C2 auto off timers. And what basically this allows you to do is set how long the menu will stay on before it turns off. You can choose between short, normal, and long, or you can go custom and choose for playback menus, image review, live view, and standby timer, how long all that stuff will be displayed before the LCD will turn off. I would just keep it at normal, just a default setting, but if you want to extend that, you can do that from here. Under self timer, we have the ability to basically have the camera wait until it fires the shutter. And if you have your camera set on a tripod and you want to do that, then this is where you set the actual delay. So you could do two seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, and up to 20 seconds. And number of shots is how many shots the camera will actually fire after that timer ends. You can choose up to nine exposures. All right. The last setting under timers AE lock is remote on duration. Now, if you have a, a remote, which in this case would be an infrared ML L3 remote, you can set up to 15 minutes of time. Now, what this does is if, say you're firing with the uh, remote, what you would have to do normally is first you have to click it once and then you have to click it the second time to actually fire. Now, after one minute, it will go back to sleep mode, so you have to have, uh, you would have to press it once and then press it again to engage. If you want to extend that time, you can do that from here and you can go up to 15 minutes. I personally don't use the remotes a lot, but if you want to do that, you can basically do it from here. Now we're under the shooting display sub menu and here we have a bunch of options. The default behavior is for the camera to beep. Now this one is really annoying because the camera will beep every time you half press and every time the camera is conf confirms that the focus is good. And this one, you can hear there's high pitch, low pitch. I turn this off, it's really annoying. All right, next we've got the viewfinder grid display. By default, it's turned off, but I always turn this on because it allows me to add a grid within the viewfinder. It, hel it helps me really with the framing and uh, whenever I need to align the horizon. So I would just keep this viewfinder grid display on. Under ISO display, if you want to change the default behavior, which is to show you how many more frames you have left in that memory card, you can turn this on and this, what this will do, it will actually show you your current ISO. Now, I personally don't do this because I do want to see how many frames I've got left, but if I wanted to have quick access to that, this is where I do this from. 
All right, D4 file number sequence. The file number sequence menu, I don't know why Nikon made this off by default because on all professional cameras, it's actually turned on by default. What this does is if you have a file name, say DSC underscore 001, and you change to another memory card, well, guess what? It will start from 001 again. I don't like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this on. By turning it on, whatever the file name was used last time, say if it was DSC underscore 0100, the next one, whenever you insert a new memory card, is going to be 101. It's not going to restart from zero. Uh, and you can basically reset it from here, and if you reset it, it will start that sequence over. So just keep this turn on. Next, we've got exposure delay mode. Now this one, what it does is, after you enable it, if you were to take a picture, the mirror will come up, the camera will wait for a short period of time before the shutter opens. And you want to do this in situations where you have a, maybe a, a very shaky setup on a tripod and you want to avoid the mirror slap. By turning this on, the camera will wait. So I have this turned off by default because if I'm doing handheld shooting, I do not want the camera to wait. On some higher end cameras, you can actually specify the amount of time the camera will wait from one second up to three seconds. So just keep this turned off by default. Now print date is something that I don't even know why Nikon would add into their cameras because this is the funky date that will be imprinted in red in your images. So if you have JPEG images, then you'll have the date or the date and time or the date counter embedded basically written right on that JPEG. You will not be able to remove it. Now, it doesn't affect raw images, so that's just something for you to keep in mind, but man, I would never ever turn this on. Now we're under the bracketing slash flash options, and we've got two options here. One is for flash control for built-in flash, and this allows you to set the camera to basically shoot either in TTL mode for the built-in flash, or you can go manual and select how powerful that flash is going to be, whether to shoot in full power, at half power, quarter power, and so on and so forth. Now, I really don't ever use that flash because it's really small, it's ugly light source, but if you do want to use it, this is where you would control it. If you do use it, TTL is probably fine 99% of the time anyway. Under auto bracketing, you have the option to select between exposure bracketing, white balance bracketing, and active delighting bracketing. I'm not sure why you would ever want to use white balance or active delighting bracketing unless you do use JPEG, but I would just leave it under exposure bracketing. Now we're under the control submenu, and here we've got five different functions. Now the first one is assign function button. On the Nikon D5200, the function button is located uh, next to the mount on the left side of the camera if I'm looking from the back and basically I can choose between these different functions. Uh, the default behavior is ISO sensitivity which makes sense and I would just leave it at that but if you wanted to choose say something like bracketing or auto uh, autofocus area mode or any of these other features then you can do that from here. Now, F2 is assigning the AEL slash AFL button. And this one is actually a really important setting for me personally, because I really like doing the focus and recompose technique. With the focus and recompose technique, you can basically focus on one uh, subject and then change your framing and still fire the shutter without having the camera refocus. And this removes the binding of focusing from half pressing the shutter release. So that's something for you to keep in mind. Basically you go here and choose AF on. If I do that, now if I half press the shutter release, it will not do anything. Maybe if I have the exposure lock turned on, it will only lock the exposure, but it will not actually uh, the, uh, focus my lens. But what will happen now is once that feature is removed from shutter release, it now becomes part of that AEL slash AFL button on the back of the camera. So I can basically focus with my thumb and then use the shutter release to fire. Now for me personally, I do keep this at AF on, but if you're confused and it's too hard for you to use your thumb for focusing, then just go back to the default, which is AE slash AF lock. 
All right, so here we've got the reverse dial rotation, and this is for people who maybe have upgraded from a different camera system or moved from a different camera system to Nikon, and or maybe you're being annoyed by the fact that it works in reverse to what you are accustomed to, and here you can basically change the rotation, uh, the, uh, the, the dial rotation to be in reverse. So if I wanted to do the exposure compensation button in reverse, this is where I set it from, and if I want to do the shutter speed or aperture, this is where I do it from. I would not mess with this unless you know what you're doing. All right, so we're going to go back now, and we are at F4, slot empty release lock. Now, by default, the camera, whenever you do not have a memory card in the camera, it will not allow you to take pictures, which is good. Because if you do enable the release, whether you have the memory card or not, the camera will still fire. The worst thing that can happen is if you're out shooting something very important and you do not have a memory card in the camera, only to realize later that none of those images were being saved. So I would just keep it under lock. The last setting is reverse indicators and this is another one that I would not mess with unless you know what you're doing because this is the way that information is displayed inside the viewfinder. By default it shows you underexposure first and then overexposure to the right of it and if you can change the behavior here to basically be the reverse of that. Alright, so we're done with the custom setting menu. Now we're going to go back to the main menu and choose setup menu. The setup menu is for you to be able to basically set up the camera and the first option you've got is format memory card. Now this is something you have to be really careful about because it will wipe out everything you have in your memory card. But one thing to keep in mind, when I started photography I remember one of the issues that I ran into was corruption my images randomly would get corrupt and I didn't know why because I was basically moving all the images from memory card without formatting the memory card. So if you want to avoid that, I recommend after you copy everything and you back up everything from memory cards, it's best to always format the memory card before you reuse it. All right, next we've got monitor brightness and that's for you to be able to adjust the brightness of the LCD screen. I just keep it at default. If I really worry about battery life, I might reduce it because technically by reducing the brightness, you should reduce the power consumption of the LCD screen. All right, we're gonna go now into the info display format and this is for you to be able to basically control how the display is shown when you press the info button. And you've got multiple options here. You can select different themes, uh, basically the way that it appears. You know, the, the, the normal one is fine, but if you want to go funky and choose different colors like this blue one, you can do that from here. And same thing between the different modes. So if I choose that, everything now is going to become blue with that blue setting. The auto info display allows me to pick when to show that info screen, which looks now blue because I changed the theme earlier. But basically when you turn your camera on and off, it will show you this by default. But when you half press it, if you have this feature turned off, which is the auto in info display, if I turn this off, when I half press it, that screen will disappear. So if you get annoyed by the fact that the info screen comes up all the time, you can basically just turn it off from here. But for beginners, it's probably best to keep it on. Now keep in mind, if you keep it on and that thing is always on, it will consume your battery faster. So I would just keep this turn off personally. Under clean image sensor, we have two options, which is basically with this camera, I have the ability to have this sensor shake at very small vibrations to try to shake off dust that's sitting on it. Now you, I can do it right now to try to clean that or I can have this camera set to clean at startup or clean at shutdown or maybe do it when I, whenever I start up or shut down. So that's something that you can choose from here. I would just have this clean at startup and if you see dust, try to do this several times. If you still see dust specks in your images, especially when shooting at small apertures, your sensor might need to be physically cleaned. All right, next we've got lock mirror up for cleaning. And this is for those situations where you're brave enough to be able to clean your sensor yourself. And if you want to do that, you come here whenever, if I press the OK button right now, the camera will basically raise the mirror mechanism and give me access to the sensor. So 
you want to make sure that before you go here that your battery is fully charged. In fact, in most Nikon DSLRs, this option will be even grayed out if your battery is not full. And the reason why they do that is because if the battery runs out and that mirror mechanism comes down as you're trying to clean it, then you will potentially break that mirror mechanism. So just keep that in mind. Next, we've got image dust off reference photo. And this is for situations where you're maybe out shooting in the field and there's no way for you to clean the sensor and you still want to take care of the dust. And here you can basically take, uh, you can start the process and, and the camera will take a photo which then it will use to try to clean up dust in other images. Now, I personally don't use this, but I know that some people are scared to clean their sensors and they might be able to use this feature. I would rather have the image sensor physically cleaned. Under video mode, you've got two options, NTSC and PAL. If you are basically in the United States, you choose NTSC as default. And if you're in Europe and potentially other countries, you choose PAL. Next, we've got HDMI, and this is basically how you choose different resolution for HDMI output. This is if you connect your camera to, say, a big screen. Next, we have flicker reduction, and here, if you're shooting in really crazy lighting conditions, say it's mercury vapor lights or fluorescent lights, you can choose your, you can basically have your camera try to reduce the flicker effect that you might get. And you can go auto, which is the one I would recommend, or you can specify hertz, 50 hertz or 60 hertz, if you know exactly what output you have in those environments. Now, I wouldn't mess with this, just keep it on our auto and the camera will try to control that flicker automatically. Next, we've got time zone and date and this is basically the menu system that you see in the very beginning when you just turn the camera on for the first time, it will allow you to set your different time zones here and you can also go and choose the date and time and the way you want date and time displayed in your camera. You also have the ability to, to have the daylight savings time turned on or off from here. If you prefer anything other than English for your menus, you can choose them from here. And as you can see, there's a wide variety of languages to choose from. Image comment is something that you can basically attach comments as part of your EXIF data. This is basically information that gets embedded into your JPEG and RAW images. If you want to put your information here, maybe your first name, last name, and, and maybe just uh, attach that to those images, you can do that from here. Don't forget to have this checked before you press that OK button, otherwise that information will not get embedded. All right, next we've got auto image rotation. Now this one is very different from the one that we saw under the playback menu because what it does, a lot of people want to turn the first one off and they end up turning this one off. And what this will do is when you take a picture, if you change orientation of your camera, say you switch from landscape to portrait mode, the camera will automatically recognize that you're shooting in vertical mode and will save that as part of the image and it will embed it into the image. So if you import it into say post-process software like Lightroom or Photoshop, that software will detect that the image was taken vertically and will automatically change the orientation. Now, if you turn this off, that information will be skipped. So keep in mind, don't confuse that setting with the one under the playback menu. It has nothing to do with it. I would always keep this option turned on. Next, we have accessory terminal, and that's for different accessories that you can connect to the side of the camera. You can uh, choose default behavior for the remote shutter release, whether it takes photos or record movies, or you can control GPS behavior. We're not gonna go into that, but if you have those accessories, you might want to explore those options. The wireless mobile adapter is also for external wireless utility. This camera doesn't have a Wi-Fi chip inside. So if you do have a mobile adapter, you can disable or enable it from here. The last option is firmware version. And from here, I can see what firmware I have installed on this Nikon D5200. And as you can see, the camera firmware is 1.01 .01 and the lens firmware is 1.009. Now, I would always recommend to run the latest firmware. So if you want to check if you are running it or not, from here, you can see what you have. And if you go to Nikon's website, you can download the latest version of that firmware. Now we're done with the setup menu and we have two more tabs. One is retouch menu and the other is my menu. Now the retouch menu is for you to be able to basically apply quick 
retouches to your images. Now keep in mind, this is not going to work for raw images unless you convert your raw files first. And all these settings, I don't know why you would want to even do them on your camera because your computer is going to give you much more flexibility when you use proper software. So I'm just going to skip that section completely. I never even touch it. The My Menu section is actually a really cool section because from here you can add items to your menu so that you can quickly access them. So if I go to Add Items, it allows me to choose all these different tabs and say if I want to go to Custom Setting Menu and I want to add something here, let's say the AFC Priority Section Behavior or maybe something like the built-in AF Assist Eliminator, this is basically where I can choose that. And if I have something that I really want, for example, Exposure Delay Mode is something that I use a lot, all I have to do is press OK and that now becomes part of this menu. And if I have multiple items that I add, it allows me to even add the uh, or change the order of that. So for example, if I want to add another menu item that I use a lot, which is ISO sensitivity settings and I click OK, now it will allow me to move that in priority. So I want that at the top and I don't mind that, but if I wanted to move that on the bottom, I can do that from here. I click OK one more time and now you can see under my menu, I've got two options. I saw sensitivity settings and exposure delay mode. Now some settings are going to have multiple sub sections. So here I've got ISO sensitivity and ISO sensitivity auto control. I can go back here at items and if I didn't want to have that, if I wanted to have a sub menu instead, from here I can choose that sub menu behavior. So if, for example, if I didn't care for the ISO sensitivity and just wanted to add auto ISO control by clicking OK, now in my menu, I do not have the main tree, I have the sub tree. So from here I can just turn that on or off. Now I'm not going to worry about that because I actually don't use that setting. But if I wanted to get rid of it, just check that, click OK. It will say, do you want to delete it? Sure, delete it. And now I'm back to where I had ISO with exposure delay mode. Now, if you have a bunch of things that you've added, you can change, you can remove them from here, you can rank them, and you can even do something like choose tab. Now, this is something that you can change the, the behavior of this My Menu. Instead of doing the My Menu where you can manually add all the stuff, you can actually set your camera so that it shows you the most recent settings. Now, if I enable that, these are things that I have changed recently and it will show me a big list of things. I personally don't see much value in that, so I'm just going to go back to my menu and that's my default behavior on this camera. That wraps up the menu system of entry-level Nikon DSLRs. Now keep in mind if you have a newer Nikon DSLR than D5200 or maybe you have a different camera, say something like a D3000 series, you might have less or more options. And if I didn't go through something that you have in your camera, just refer to the camera manual and you should be able to understand what that feature does. I hope after watching this video, you will feel less intimidated by all these camera options and you'll be able to get the best out of your camera. Thanks for watching.